Good morning. Thank you for uh, turning out a little bit earlier today. Um, I'm not going to go through the whole housekeeping menu this morning. I think you all um, have found your way to lunches and morning teas and um, to the restroom. But if you do need any help again, please find somebody with a green um, bib and they can help you um, with any questions or any um, needs that you might have. Um, I just want to alert you to some program changes for today. So if you can take note of those. And also remind everyone that sessions are first come, first served. So if there is something particularly that you're um, very interested in, that you might want to make it a point of arriving um, a little bit early so you can get a seat. Um, so we're going to begin this morning. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Leonie Kronberg, who's the uh, Vice President for the World Council for Gifted and Talented Children, who's going to introduce this morning's keynote speaker. Good morning, everyone. It's lovely to see you all out of bed on a Saturday morning and attending a university. So it's a great pleasure of mine to actually have you here. And we're conscious that people will probably be wandering in throughout the next hour. Okay, I'll just start with acknowledgement of country. I would like to acknowledge the Bedigal people of the Eora Nation, the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today. I would also like to pay my respects to elders both past and present and extend that respect to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who are present here today as well. Okay, thank you. Now, this is my great pleasure today because I'm going to introduce you to someone in Australia from Victoria, from Monash University, someone who's been a colleague of mine for the last 12 years and one of our outstanding educators within Australia. So I'll just introduce Professor Helen Watt. Helen is Professor in the Faculty of Education at Monash University and Australian Research Council Fellow 2011-2015. In addition to recently being awarded the prestigious ARC Future Fellowship Award. Previously, she served at the universities of Michigan, Western Sydney, Sydney, and Macquarie. Her interests include STEM motivation and engagement, gendered educational and occupational choices, and quantitative analyses for developmental data. Her work has implications for redressing the gender imbalance in mathematics and science-related careers, and supporting career development for beginner teachers. Helen is founder and coordinator of Network Gender and STEM, associate editor for AERA Open, and on the editorial boards of the International Journal of Quantitative Research and Education, Contemporary Educational Psychology, and Australian Journal of Education. She's also one of the rare professors in education in our country. May I? Have you joined me and welcome Professor Helen Watt to the stage this morning. Thank you, Leonie, for the lovely introduction. And it's been my pleasure to work with Leonie for the last 12 years, um, more than a decade, wow. Um, and it's my pleasure to be here today. Thank you for the invitation to um, share my work concerning harnessing girls' and women's talent potentials in STEM domains. Um, and of course, this is an issue not only for the STEM workforce sector, if we're losing out on girls' and women's participation, but also, as I will be um, sharing empirical findings about today, uh, has implications for girls' and women's own futures and delimiting um, potential access to certain high salary and high status fields of education and occupation. So um, how I have structured this is first of all talking about the STEM shortages and who is pursuing STEM uh, and why we care about this. Uh, and then I'd like to share findings from my STEPS study of transition and education pathways of two cohorts that I've been following. So one um, was a group that I recruited in grade seven back in the 90s 
and I've recently been following up when they're in their late 30s. So I've got not only their motivations and aspirations during adolescence, but actually where they've ended up. And secondly, a more recent contemporary longitudinal study that I've just followed out from secondary school now. Um, so the first is focused primarily around mathematics, and the second I expanded to also look at science and different types of sciences. So first of all, um, who is studying STEM and do we care? Uh, so the two main arguments have frequently been put forth. First, the economic argument about, um, well, we're missing out on half of the pool of potential STEM talent if we're not trying to exploit girls' and women's talents in these domains. So we're not harnessing potential. Um, and secondly is the concern about girls' and women's own individual opportunities. Um, and particularly mathematics was identified back in 1980 by Lucy Sells as the critical filter that delimits access to certain kinds of high status and high salary pathways. Uh, and as I'll show you with more recent data than 1980, um, this is still the case today, and not only for STEM-related pursuits, but other kinds of high status and high salary pursuits that um, they may be cutting themselves out of prematurely. So there's the two sorts of um, argument. Uh, some people who are concerned with gender equity, as indeed I am, um, object to um, the force of the first argument um, thinking that we should really be concerned uh, at an individual level and why is it that only once something has an economic impact that it gains any kind of um, tread. But uh, from my point of view, the more um, forces that we can bring to bear on the issue, the better if we can create a better impetus in terms of girls' and women's own outcomes. Okay. So first of all, um, STEM participation is not only considered a pressing issue in Australia, but also in a number of other countries. Um, and uh, only 0.4% of Australian university students graduate with maths and stats qualifications, not many, compared with the OECD average of 1%, which is not many either. Um, and in the US, an interesting statistic that while only about 5% of the workforce is employed in STEM fields, actually this accounts for more than half of the nation's sustained economic growth. So you will have heard lots of these messages in the media and put out by the office of the chief scientist about you know, STEM, 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 we need more workers in STEM. Um, this is often referred to as the STEM supply pipeline, the idea that um, people and especially girls leak out of the STEM pipeline at different transition points. And this is not a metaphor that I particularly like because I think it sounds really reactive and unagentic and that individuals are just sort of reacting to falling out of cracks that they encounter in the pipeline rather than perhaps thoughtfully and agentically looking ahead to what would be at the end of the pipeline and making considered informed decisions about whether these are the kinds of work environments where they would like to end up. Um, so, uh, this is who is um, still in year 12 in Australia and available to be in the STEM pipeline. Approximately three quarters of young Australians remain at school to year 12. Um, slightly more girls, you can see the stats there. And a national snap snapshot then of who is participating in the different levels of mathematics and the different kinds of sciences at year 12. First, mathematics. So as you know, obviously the different states and territories have different um, structures in senior high school. So um, this was a mapping conducted by the ACER, um, organising courses into basic, intermediate or advanced mathematics. So the dark green line at the bottom um, is the proportion of Year 12 students undertaking advanced mathematics courses, which is low and declining over time, whereas the light green tall bars are the pr proportion of students participating in basic mathematics, which is high and increasing over time. Science. Um, first of all, between 1992 to 2009, 
uh, the proportion of Year 12 students taking sciences fell by a third for biology, a quarter for chemistry, a third for physics. And if we take an even longer term view, this looks even more striking. Um, so this is biology from 1976 to 2007. Chemistry, physics, geology, psychology, which is a relatively new and growing area, and other. So interestingly, the rank order remains the same, uh, but we are seeing declines overall. Who is studying the different STEM domains? Um, so it's a gendered issue already by the end of secondary school. In advanced maths, physics and chemistry, there are higher concentrations of boys, students who aspire to higher education studies, those with higher prior achievement from higher socioeconomic backgrounds, and Asian students more than any other cultural group, even taking those other factors into account. Um, if we look over on the right of the table for tech and computer studies, which is still STEM, we see a different pattern a higher concentration of boys again, but lower prior achievers and those from lower socioeconomic status. So this is making the point already that while it's convenient to refer collectively to STEM, um, and probably it's useful in the policy and political arena, um, it's very important in our research and educational endeavours that we're more nuanced in thinking about the subdomains of STEM because there are different patterns in each. Um, girls, on the other hand, more concentrated in arts and home sciences, also lower prior achievers and those from lower socioeconomic backgrounds. The next um, transition point in the um, STEM supply pipeline um, would be post-school. So here's uh, proportions of students commencing university in 2006 in an audit conducted again by the ACER. And I've pulled out the STEM-related slices so you can see that those entering non-science studies are 61%, and the proportions undertaking the different STEMs over there, of which health is the, was, in 2006, the highest proportion at 15%. This is uh, numbers of enrolments in different STEM uh, domains on commencement of university, and then I'll tell you about who actually completes um, and also remember, more students are attending university these days. So this is number, not percent. Anyone want to have a guess at the top escalating line? Which STEM domain? Business? Bio? Technology? Engineering? <laughs> well. The bio, et cetera, things, it's health. So this is um, high and growing. That's from 2002 till 2010. Uh, the others, um, natural and physical sciences was next. Then IT actually had a little downturn after 2002. Um, engineering, fairly flat, as is agriculture and environment. So that's university commencement. Of the people commencing, um, completion rates are higher for health and natural physical sciences at 73 and 69% respectively. Lower for engineering, 58%. Uh, and agriculture environment, between 48 to 60%. And only half of students who commence in IT fields actually complete those studies. So that was a report by the Office of the Chief Scientist in 2012. Who is teaching our uh, um, next generation of potential STEM pipelineers? Um, so here are the proportions of people in a DEST audit in 2006 in the final year of their secondary teacher education studies. So we presume that they'll graduate, they're nearly finished. Uh, and I've pulled out again the STEM slices there. Unfortunately, this is not enough STEM teachers. The um, staff in Australia's schools studies, there have been three so far. So the first one, based on 2007 data, published in 2008, these bars show the proportions of teachers teaching different STEM domains at different grade levels um, who do have 
the qualifications to be teaching in that domain. So things look fairly dismal for grade seven to 10 IT. Uh, and the best that it gets is only just over 70% with qualifications in the relevant domain for senior chemistry and senior maths. So the situation is more pronounced in terms of grades 7 to 10, which arguably is when the foundations are being set before students then self-select into what they're going to do in senior secondary school that then has consequences for what they can do after school. In their next... Um, study, 2010 data, um, things got worse for senior chemistry and physics, stayed the same for mathematics, and got a little bit better for IT, and they didn't include um, the other domains in the second follow-up, so I haven't made any comment there. And in their uh, most recent report, the situation was um, not remedied. So we need to be concerned also about the STEM teaching supply pipeline, because and I feel sorry for these teachers who presumably do not want to be teaching out of field. I don't blame the teachers for one moment. But if we don't have suitably qualified teachers to um, teach and inspire uh, students in the different STEM domains, wouldn't we expe expect declining engagement and participation? Um, and I'm sure everyone's very familiar with John Hattie's visible learning and influential meta-analyses about the largest effects on students' achievement and engagement. Teachers have the largest, largest effects, so we need to be worried about this. Um, the different array of factors that are proposed to impact on participation or dropout through the STEM supply pipeline have been arranged in terms of individual level factors institutional and structural level factors and uh, with the different leakage points at different transition points when there are opportunities to opt out or opt down. Uh, and the most influential theoretical framework um, that's around that has been applied to this problem is the expectancy value framework of Jacqueline Eccles and her colleagues, which I've got up here. Um, down... Oh. I can't get it to show up. Down the very um, bottom left is achievement. And then there's all this stuff <laughs> that um, filters the child or adolescent or adult's um, interpretations of those achievements, which then, in the end, feed back on subsequent achievements. So emotions come into play, motivations, goals, socialises, interpretations and feedbacks, uh, and of course the cultural milieu in which um, the child lives. So over on the middle right are the outcomes that this model was developed to explain being achievement-related choices and persistence, engagement, participation, efforts. And in red, I've put the most proximal influences in this model, which are up the top right, um, self-concepts of ability and expectations of success. So that's the can I do it box. And bottom right, the task values with different kinds of values in there, which is the do I care box. And Eccles's um, proposition, which is supported by a wealth of empirical work, is that one or the other isn't enough, you have to both be able to think that you can, and as she says, give a damn, um, in order to want to be able to pursue mathematics or whatever domain it is that we're interested in. So the different kinds of values, and there's been a lot of really interesting productive research within this model where people have taken different elements to just really um, interrogate particular pieces. My work's been concentrated in the red area. The different kinds of values are um, interest or enjoyment value, attainment value, which refers to the perceived personal importance of doing well at something. It's important for me to be good at maths. Utility value, which is about how useful in general that the task is regarded as being. So maths is a useful subject. Um, and fourth, where there's been the least research and my more contemporary work has concentrated, are negative values, cost values. These are things that would push you away 
So it could be financial cost, effort cost, emotional exhaustion, um, opportunity cost, other things that you might need to give up or invest less time in if you pursue maths in this case. Okay. Um, so moving to the first of the two longitudinal studies, so this is the longer ago one, but with the recent long-term follow-up, and the concentration here was on maths, as I mentioned. I have science in the more recent study. So this was 1,323 Australian adolescents that I followed almost all the way through secondary school. I really couldn't get into year 12, I really tried, but through grades 7 to 11, and then followed up in their mid-30s, these were students from three co-educational government schools in metropolitan Sydney, matched for upper middle socioeconomic status by the Australian Bureau of Statistics. First, looking at their aspired and actual mathematics participation in terms of senior secondary school enrolments in the higher school certificate, the HSC. So these paired bars show for boys and girls, each pair, the first pair are at the start of year seven, grade seven, then the next pair at the end of year seven, middle grade eight, the start of years nine, 10 and 11. And the HSC structure at the time, in the 90s, ranged from the lowest maths in practice, MIP, through maths in society, two units, three units, and the most advanced, four units maths. And these bars have the coloring down the bottom is for proportions of each of boys and girls who aspired to, and in year 11 actually enrolled in, uh, down the bottom are the lower levels of maths and at the top are the higher levels. So you can see, first of all, that it looks really similar over time. So their aspirations through secondary school as well as what they actually ended up enrolling in looks really similar over time. And the second thing to notice is that the coloring at the bottom is more for girls, and the colouring at the top is more for boys, showing that higher proportions of boys than girls aspired to and later actually enrolled in more advanced maths levels, conversely for girls. What about their aspired um, future occupations? So I asked them in an open-ended question what um, work that they planned to have when they grew up, um, and I then coded these using a really useful coding database called ONET. It's just available online. The Occupational Network Classification Index put out by the um, US um, Department of Labor. And you can code careers in all kinds of different ways. It's really useful. Uh, and one of the ways that you can code them is the extent to which mathematical skills and knowledge are required in the job. It's now um, on a 101-point scale, but at the time, it was on a four-point scale from none, any, average, and high. Okay, so here's my graph of um, the extent to which their aspired careers um, were mathematically related. So again, with the no maths being down the bottom, the black colour is careers career aspirations that um, ONET says involve no maths, up to the top colouring is careers involving high maths. And again, it looks really similar over throughout secondary school, and it looks really like the other graph. So we've got higher proportions of girls and boys aspiring to careers involving no maths, and conversely for boys. Examples of um, careers of those different codes, by the way, for no maths, um, sports, music, journalism, any maths, hospitality, fashion, trades, average, business, vet, computing, and high maths, engineering, accounting, scientist, just to give you an idea of the classification system. Okay, so um, through, through secondary schooling, it seems as if these aspired, and for enrolments, actual participation differences um, are pretty robust and resonate with national stats and stats from other countries for enrolments. So why is this? Um, oh, just to make a brief comment on um, the USA, because I have some international data later where this will become relevant. So um, the achievement, uh, sorry, the enrolment um, gender gap 
in the USA has closed a lot more than here in mathematics, um, presumably due to a number of levers and disincentives from opting out in terms of college and university admission requirements, which we haven't done so much here, although there's a lot of talk about it. But whether this translates into uh, young people wanting to stay in the STEM pipeline after um, is an interesting question. Uh, and I'll share findings about that across um, Australian and US and Canadian samples a bit later. Okay, so it's not due to achievement differences, not in my data, um, where I used ACER PAT maths tests, um, and there were no gender differences at any time point, and Janet Hyde's meta-analyses are very convincing. Oh, the Australian Council for Educational Research, um, which is a... Uh, private, commercial, mm. uh, research institute. I'm not sure. I'm not trying to be cute there. I'm not sure. <laughs> um. mm -hmm. OK, it's not a for-profit organisation. But they organise our involvement in PISA and TIMS and all the kind of international assessments. Um. OK, so not due to achievement differences. We need other explanations. And in the expectancy value framework, it's expectancies or self-concepts and these task values that are the main influences. So what about that? Um, so these are measured um, by self-report survey items, multiple items for each construct that students rate. So there are some example questions up there. So for self-concept, compared with other students in your class, how talented do you consider yourself to be at maths? From one, not at all, to seven, very talented. Um, intrinsic value, how much do you like maths? Utility value, how useful do you think mathematical skills are in the workplace? So using, taking advantage of the longitudinal design, I wanted to examine impacts um, of gender, prior achievement in, in grade nine, and then the different expectancies and values at grade 10 impacting on actual enrolments, high school maths level at grade 11, and aspired mathematical career plans on the ONET coding at grade 11. So, let's see. Um, so girls regarded maths as statistically significantly more difficult. I'm only going to show significant paths. So this uh, coefficient can range from zero to one, if it's a, in the positive direction, or zero to minus one in the negative direction. So 0.12 is not huge, but it is significant. Um, girls were significantly less interested in maths and thought that they were less able. Note that there is no arrow from gender to achievement because there was no significant association between gender and achievement. So that lower self-concept is despite similar ability. Uh, higher achievers in mathematics previously were more interested in maths subsequently had higher self-concept, you would hope so, but it's not that strong, is it? You might think that would be stronger. So there's all these interpretations and emotions and affect and motivations that um, filter. Uh, and enrolled in higher maths levels. Students who regarded maths as more difficult, um, thought it was less useful, were less interested, that's quite a strong effect, minus 0.43. Uh, and had substantially lower self-concepts, makes sense. Those who were more interested enrolled in more advanced maths, as did those with higher self-concepts, and those who enrolled in more advanced maths aspired to careers that were substantially more mathematical. Although, as I mentioned, it's not perfectly clear to me that the arrow should go that way. I think it could um, equally be that young people are looking ahead to the kinds of careers and futures that they wish to have and choosing their HSC subjects accordingly. So I'm sure it's a reciprocal dynamic. Okay, so expectancies and values matter for um, actual enrolments and maths-related career aspirations. There was no um, arrow connecting utility value with um, the participation outcomes, but there was this interesting significant interaction effect of gender and utility value on career maths relatedness. So the significant difference is where I've circled there. What, what this is saying is that boys who regard maths as even moderately useful 
are equally likely as boys who regard maths as of high usefulness to aspire to highly maths-related careers, whereas girls who regard maths as moderately useful are equally likely as girls who regard maths as low usefulness and aspire to low maths-related careers. So this says that um, utility value is a more salient concern in girls' choice making. And the work of Jacqueline Eccles has found that um, it's important to girls to pursue careers that they regard as socially meaningful and important. So there's a heap of um, potential levers for action right there in terms of connecting maths to its social uses and purposes and how various STEM-related career examples do help and contribute and improve society. Uh, with Jacqueline Eccles, we collected up um, a bunch of international researchers um, who had longitudinal data and interested in the pressing concern of girls and women um, choosing female stereotype domains. And in particular, um, we conducted an international comparative study with um, her um, data from Michigan, USA, my already introduced data from Sydney, Australia, and um, Daniel Keating's data from Ontario, Canada. So these are three culturally similar contexts, but they differ in really interesting ways in terms of the curriculum choice structure that's available to students in senior secondary school. Um, so these kinds of um, international comparisons I think of as natural experiments which allow you to highlight and contrast salient cultural dimensions to um, shed light on how different aspects might be contributing to different outcomes in different contexts. Um, so this allowed us to examine a heap of interesting questions. So I already mentioned about the gender gap closing a lot more in the US uh, in terms of upper secondary enrolments. So would that translate into more maths related career aspirations or would there be a, a leaky pipeline after the end of secondary school? How relevant is this, the differences in degree of choice? Um, and moving beyond maths relatedness, it's often used sort of synonymously as prestigious careers. So this is a frequently assumed but untested uh, assumption that more advanced mathematical related careers are more prestigious. Um, so are they? And maybe girls are choosing careers that are equally prestigious but less maths related, in which case do we care so much from a gender equity standpoint, not just the economic driver standpoint? Um, and for girls who do aspire to mathematical careers, would they be of equal status to the mathematical career aspirations of boys? Or might they be aspiring to the lower status of the maths-related careers? To mix my metaphors, might the leaky pipeline have a glass ceiling? Okay. So the samples, um, well, it was opportune in a sense, but you know, these longitudinal large-scale survey studies aren't just lying around all over the place, um, and the context was similar enough and our measures were similar enough that this seemed like a really worthwhile thing to do. Um, so you can see the numbers and the grade time points for the three samples up there, and we all were using expectancy value measures of Eccles. Um, and so we had the expectancies and values at time one and the aspirations at time two, which were at the end of secondary school. Um, so, the differences in the choice structure. So, at the time in New South Wales, the middle course, two units, was prerequisite to certain university degrees, but no university degrees required the highest four units or indeed the three units maths. So, this is a very free choice structure for students to participate in the most advanced mathematics. So might um, interests and values play a greater role when there's more choice and fewer levers? In the Michigan US sample at the time, most universities required these maths courses in senior secondary school, which um, leaves less room for choice for aspiring college-bound youth. So it's kind of a university filter. 
Um, in the Ontario sample, it was kind of in between. So students had to do at least six advanced courses and one had to be grade 11 maths to attend university. To enter scientific degrees, another had to be grade 12 maths. So this is sort of a STEM university filter. Um, our key questions, would gender differences be more pronounced when there's a real option for girls to opt out? So in my data. Uh, would interest play a greater role when there's more choice? Would importance value be more relevant for girls? Think of that interesting interaction effect that I had and Eccles's work about girls being attracted to careers that have social worth and value. Um, and might expectancies and values for maths relate not only as a filter to mathematical career plans, but to prestigious career plans more generally. And what about this pipeline? Keeping students in maths longer, um, would this translate to more mathematical related career plans, or might we have a leaky, broken pipeline? Uh, and the leaky pipeline glass ceiling was also of interest. Okay. So uh, gender differences were more pronounced in my Australian data. So boys were more interested in maths, uh, enrolled in more advanced maths at the end of high school, and aspired to more mathematical careers. Whereas in both North American samples, the only gender difference was that boys considered themselves more able than the girls, despite equivalent measured performance. So our thinking about that was that the comparative testing regime in North America, which we didn't really have here then, but I guess we do now, um, that that might focus students' uh, attentions much more on their abilities. Whereas um, the degree of choice in our setting might focus students a lot more on their interests. Um, so it seems that we could speculate from this that earlier specialisation in the New South Wales setting um, amplif amplifies gender differences in maths participation. So when girls perceive a real choice to opt out, they do so, or opt down. Um, and the different structures appear to activate different choice processes. Self-concepts, or ability expectancy beliefs, was the most important predictor in both North American samples of um, educational and occupational aspirations, whereas intrinsic value was the key predictor in my data. Importance value played a greater role for girls in all three settings, so it does seem to bear out this idea that um, unless they regard maths as useful and important, that they're unlikely to aspire um, to pursue it. And intriguingly, mathematical expectancies and values not only impacted maths enrolments and career maths aspirations, but also non-mathematical educational aspirations in terms of the highest level of education that students plan to attain, and the prestige level, again coded using ONET, of students' career aspirations. So the critical filter um, seems to be operating very well in, in these three samples. Uh, in terms of um, cultural um, ethos, Apparently, uh, this greater choice and so on fits with our Australian ethos. On the um, Inglehart Veltzel cultural map of the world, there's a survival to self expression dimension where higher scores mean that the culture is more focused on pursuing your interests and loves and passions and self actualization and happiness. And Australia is actually third on that, so we care a lot about that. Um, and Canada is sixth and the US is eighth. So this sort of, this greater choice and freedom of choice is presumably not an accident, but sort of fits with our culture. But it does raise the question of how much choice should we be giving students to opt out of particular subjects, especially if maths does operate as a critical filter in this kind of way. Um, but, oh, next slide. So um, in the US sample, we had a broken pipeline. So even though there was no gender difference in maths enrolments, um, there was no connection between the level of maths that students were taking and mathematical career aspirations. So it's not a silver bullet. If our concern 
is to promote greater participation in the STEM work workforce, especially by girls and women. It's not a silver bullet to make them keep studying maths until the end of high school. So that would be a very blunt instrument, and we need to think more sensitively about how much choice and when. Uh, career maths relatedness did relate to career prestige, moderately, uh, in the order of about 0.45. So this is frequently assumed, but uh, hadn't been tested. And uh, positively, there was no significant gender difference in the relationship. So the leak leaky pipeline did not have a glass ceiling. But of course, these are all aspirations. These are all career aspirations. And we don't all end up doing what we might like to, or indeed, what we think we might like to do can change. So what about 17 years later? So despite the fact that um, at the time that I followed these students through secondary school, there was no internet, no Facebook, no LinkedIn, um, I actually have managed to find 643 643 of them, which is pretty great <laughs> um, to discover their actual occupational outcomes. Um, so I'm just going to show you a few, few little things here. Um, on the left is the end of high school, their career aspirations coded by ONET in terms of maths relatedness, from none down to high, and the number of students that were in each group, so none was the most popular <laughs> group. And then on the right side is their jobs 17 years later coded in the same way. So the relationship is significant but modest and of the same strength for boys and girls, 0.20 for boys, 0.21 for girls. So the aspirations and the outcomes in terms of mathematicalness um, is associated. The black arrows show stability paths, so people whose actual is the same as their aspired all that time ago, and these are numbers of people. Um, the red shows noticeable off diagonals, so of people who had aspired none, well actually a bunch of them did go into jobs that involved low or mid. Maybe they hadn't realised that those jobs <laughs> did, I don't know. Um, <laughs> the lows um, trended also to mid. The mids uh, trended everywhere. <laughs> um, and the high trended also to mid. And these dashed paths show rare um, deviations. OK, so um, aspirations and actual were related. What about the relevance of motivations, expectancies and values in high school to what happens in terms of actual jobs? So these. This is from um, the end of high school. Girls are yellow and boys um, are meant to be, boys are green. Um, this shows the prediction from end of high school expectancies and values to maths relatedness of jobs all those years later. So you can see that for both boys and girls, students who had thought that they were more capable, higher self-concept in high school, were more likely to end up in more maths-related careers. Um, for boys who had been more interested and enjoyed maths more, they were also more likely. And for girls, there was an interesting um, push away factor that showed up. So girls who had found maths difficult in high school were less likely to be pursuing mathematical careers all that time later. Um, well, if self-concepts and values are so important, then um, we'd better be worried about how they develop. Um, this line of work initially focused on the junior high transition, finding um, negative declines over time, uh, well, over the transition, uh, and um, finding that these related to changes in the environment, such as disruptions to peer networks, more normative assessment where you're compared with other people, multiple teachers, greater curricular differentiation. Um, but longer-term studies, including my own, show that unfortunately this is part of a longer-term declining pattern, and in particular that students do not appear to recover post-transition. So in this study, using the same data, um, I used latent growth curve models to estimate um, trajectories uh, through secondary school for boys and girls. This is um, maths self-concept. Boys are the dashed line, girls are the solid line from the start of grade seven through to grade 11. 
and the little widgets on the lines are 95% confidence intervals. So anywhere where those don't overlap, we've got statistically significant point estimates between boys and girls. So here you can see um, linear slight decline and straight lines and a stable magnitude of gender difference over that whole period. So the students are entering secondary school already with um, boys feeling that they're more capable than girls and that same magnitude of gender difference stays there through secondary school. This is despite equivalent measured mathematical performance. I will just briefly show you, I collected um, parallel data for Eng English because I was interested in um, male versus female stereotype domains in this study. Um, and what you can see there is that the 95% confidence intervals overlap all the way, so no gender differences in English self-concept. But actually, the girls outperformed the boys on the ACER um, TORCH English comprehension assessments at each time point. So it's kind of the same effect. So in maths, even though girls are performing equally well, they feel less able. In English, even though they're performing better, they feel equally able. So it's kind of the same effect that boys are generally more confident or girls are generally less confident, even in female-typed domains. Uh, this is for intrinsic value, interest. So again, stable magnitude of gender difference all the way through. Not linear. Interest drop-offs occur more in junior secondary school. So that would be where we would want to zoom in and try and do something about the interest value of mathematics if we wanted to uh, attend to that. For utility value, one trajectory there, no gender difference described boys and girls, and not linear. Here the drop-offs happen in senior secondary school, um, presumably as people are making relative judgments about the usefulness and worth and making their subject selections. And even though there's no gender difference in the developmental trajectory, we need to be particularly more concerned about this decline for girls and boys because we know that utility value is a more salient concern in girls' occupational planning. So the declines might be explained by greater realism and more normative assessment, more social comparisons with others, but not the gender differences, which were remarkably stable where they occurred. And in collaborations with colleagues in Germany and the United States, we've found the same patterns. Uh, and in the US, Jacobs, Eccles and colleagues found gender differences in self-concept as early as grade two. <laughs> I'm not sure I even really knew what maths was. But um, this says that di differences in self-concepts and values need to be addressed really early. It's not to say we can't do anything about it later, but we do need to be attending to this from very early. Um, so in an intensive qualitative phase, um, I did in-depth interviews with 120 of these participants when they were in the mid of secondary school. Um, I found some really interesting um, patterns where same stimuli led to polarised outcomes for underestimating girls, girls who were high achievers but had low self-concept, and overestimating boys who were low achievers and had high self-concept. And one that I found particularly interesting was interpretations of encouragement from significant others, including teachers. So the underestimating boys took this as um, affirmation of their high capability because they were getting encouragement and praise. The girls took this actually completely the opposite as indicating that they mustn't be very capable if, the, if others thought that they needed reassurance. So we, we need to be alert to the fact that um, interventions that we might try are not going to be received in the same way by everyone. Um, in my new contemporary longitudinal study, um, briefly, <laughs> actually, the thing I really want to get to here is um, the clusters. So I mentioned um, that here I was um, focused not only on promotive expectancies and values, but also the rarely investigated costs. So here are examples of cost items and factors that I developed. So effort cost, for example, achieving in science sounds like it really requires more effort than I'm willing to put into it, rated from not at all to extremely, one to seven. 
Psychological cost is to do with stress and anxiety. And social cost, for example, I'm concerned that working hard in maths classes might mean I lose some of my close friends. So I was interested in push-pull, uh, maths and science. And I wanted to move beyond um, whole group boys versus girls comparisons. So I conducted um, person-centered cluster analyses to develop profiles of students that emerged from the data and then looked at proportions of boys and girls in those different clusters that emerged rather than just imposing the gender difference on it. So um, first of all, um, gender differences alive and well in this contemporary study. So boys had higher self-concept in both maths and science. Girls had higher psychological costs, stress and anxiety, in both maths and science. Boys also had higher interest and importance value in maths. Girls had higher social cost also in science. And these profiles is what I'm wanting to get here. And not only outcomes in terms of um, aspirations, I also was interested, now that I'm including these negative costs, in potential outcomes also for psychological well-being. So I included the DAS, depression, anxiety, stress scales, to see if there might be consequences not only for achievement striving, but also for um, mental health. Three clusters emerged for science. Um, the first one on the left was high on the positive expectancies and values, the blue and green bars, and low on the new costs. I called this group positively engaged. The next one was rather high on both, and for reasons that will become apparent, I called this cluster the struggling ambitious. And the third one was um, rather low on the positives and um, moderate on the costs, and I called this group disengaged. In maths, I got those same three clusters and a fourth one that was um, rather in undifferentiated, rather moderate on everything, and I called that group indifferent. So let's look at the antecedents and consequences of those and why I gave them those names, and if it even matters to have identified these types. Um, so first of all, the positively engaged and the struggling ambitious um, differed only on their perceived costs and on their depression, anxiety, stress scores. So they had equivalent history of achievement, um, aimed marks, uh, maths and science related career aspirations, but it appears that the high costs that were experienced by this group debilitated their psychological well-being. So it's really important to have included costs. If I hadn't included costs, I would not have been able to identify this group and the consequences for their psychological health. Um, disengaged was uh, equally psychologically healthy as the positively engaged, but lower on achievement striving and aimed marks and history of results. So it seems that their positive expectancies and values um, promotes, uh, sorry, their low expectancies and values erode their achievement striving, but low costs bolster well-being. And the indifferent in maths only had rather depressed well-being, moderate aimed marks. Um, so it seems that even moderate perceived costs can exert some negative effects on achievement striving and psychological health. I think it's useful to think of these four clusters along two dimensions of psychological health and achievement striving, like so. Um, so the positively engaged and struggling ambitious matched in achievement striving, but the struggling ambitious have debilitated Psych uh, depression, anxiety, stress. Positively engaged and disengaged, equally good psychological health, but the disengaged are not um, trying so hard. Uh, and the indifferent in maths only. Um, gender differences appeared only in maths. There was a higher proportion of boys in the struggling ambitious and a higher proportion of girls in the disengaged, consonant with um, social stereotypes, I think, where girls have more permission to disengage. It's okay not to be good at maths. Uh, so these patterns, um, I did this in maths and in science. The diagonal here shows numbers of students who were in the same type in maths and science. But the red numbers show substantial off diagonals of people who were in a different type in maths and science. 
So this suggests there is a significant association. It suggests possibly a dispositional base, but a great positive message in terms of curricular levers and learning environments, because people, it's not fate, um, people can be in different types in different subject domains, even within STEM. So there's a lot we can do to try and shift that. And the message here is we need not just to be promoting expectancies and values, but also to be guarding against costs. So let me skip to my big message. Um, I do think there's a gender problem. Um, the graph I just skipped clearly shows that, um, <laughs> that, um, that girls do not aspire to lower status or lower salary careers. Um, so they do aspire more than boys to pursue their interests, make a social contribution, enhance gender equity and work with youth. So this matches the Eccles findings. Um, girls and women are more interested in occupations that allow them to socially contribute and help others. As mentioned, heaps of levers for action there in connecting up maths and science to their social uses and purposes. Um, so the STEM shortage, especially in advanced maths and physical sciences, is more pronounced in contemporary data. We need to be talking about the nuances of STEM, not as one monolith collective. Teachers who are asked to teach out of field in STEM, this is likely to affect student learning and engagement. So we need to be worried about the STEM teaching supply pipeline as well as the STEM student pipeline. Um, especially girls opt out when they perceive a real choice, raises difficult questions about how much choice we should give and when. The critical filter, um, maths is still operating as a critical filter um, to also aspired career prestige, not only to maths related outcomes. Expectancies and values impact STEM studies and career aspirations. Values play a greater role when there's more choice. Importance value is more important for girls. Expectancies and values decline through secondary schooling with a robust gender gap. Girls perceive lower talents than their achievements warrant. And we need to worry about their divergent interpretations of social influences. Costs impact well-being, even for students who have high expectancies and values, achievements and aspirations. Aspirations moderately predict actual STEM-related careers even 17 years later. We need more long-term longitudinal studies and moving beyond our very culturally similar context. We need more different settings as stronger natural experiments, especially settings where there is noticeably high STEM participation and small or no gender gaps where we can illuminate um, this much further. None of this would be possible without all the um, groups that have supported the work and the STEP study website has all my associated publications and findings and I would be very pleased to hear from anyone. Thank you. You can understand why I enjoy working with Helen. We never have dull conversations and uh, for those of you in Sydney who are interested in pursuing a PhD in STEM, unfortunately for us in, at Monash, Helen's leaving us in October because the University of Sydney have managed to entice her back to be a prof in their department. So you can consider Helen as a future supervisor for your PhD in STEM if you're interested. Please join me in thanking Helen for her presentation today that was most interesting. And if everyone would move to their next session, the next one, 9.45, starts in the room.